this century is Africa's. This decade in a world where dreams clash with reality, few stories resonate with that of Dr. Francis Kwame Nkrumah. This is the tale of a visionary leader whose aspirations for African unity were met with betrayal and deceit, ultimately leading to his downfall, but not before radiating the fire of liberation that swept across the African continent in the second half of the 20th century. And cover the sad aspects of his biography as we explore how he was ultimately overthrown with the help of the CIA while visiting China during the Vietnam War. Don't be mistaken though, as his leadership was not all rosy because he made some pretty questionable policy decisions such as nationalizing and misgoverning the major sectors of the Ghana's economy. Undoubtedly, Dr. Osage for Kwame Nkrumah, as many Africans proudly regard him, etched his indelible mark on the pages of Ghana's struggle for independence and the Pan-African movement. Meanwhile, please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe so that more people can see this content. To fully understand Kwame Nkrumah's story, one must go back to the early 20th century Gold Coast, which was later renamed Ghana. By the way, Ghana means warrior king in the Soninke language. So what was Kwame Nkrumah's early life like? Kwame Nkrumah was born in 1909 in the small town of Nkroful in the British Gold Coast to a goldsmith father known as Nuya Kofi and Madame Nanyeba, a retail trader. As a young boy, he excelled academically, earning scholarships that granted him the opportunity to study abroad. It was during these formative years that Nkrumah's passion for social justice and anti-colonialism began to take shape. Nkrumah received both his Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Theology in 1942 from Lincoln University. He continued his education at the University of Pennsylvania where he received a Master's in Philosophy and a Master's of Education, both in 1943. Nkrumah voraciously read the works of Marcus Garvey, the Black Nationalist and the founder of the first Universal Negro Improvement Association. He also religiously studied the works of Karl Marx, which mostly focuses on the struggles between capitalists and the working class. He co-founded the African Student Association as well. While roaming the streets of Harlem in New York, Nkrumah met various activists and revolutionary readers, such as Carlos Cook, C.L. James, and the Marxist Chinese-American Grace Lee. In 1945, though, he left the United States for Britain to study law and completed his doctoral thesis in philosophy. After a 12-year stint in the USA and Britain, Nkrumah returned home at the invitation of the United Gold Coast Convention Party, UGCC. This was the first political party of the country where he, was, he became the General Secretary. So why was Nkrumah revered? You see, Ghana struggled for independence from the British spearheaded nationalism and pan-Africanism in Africa resulted in almost indep immediate independence of 30 African nations. In the 1956 general election, the CPP, which was Nkrumah's new party, won an outright majority, gaining 71 seats out of the possible 104. With charisma and conviction, Nkrumah rallied the masses, calling for independence and self-determination. His impassioned speeches echoed through the streets, captivating the hearts of the people. Ghana stood united under his leadership, as hope soared high above the African continent. By 1957, the culmination of years of relentless activism and unwavering dedication manifested in Ghana's long-awaited independence. Kwame Nkrumah emerged as the president and the harbinger of a new era brimming with promise and potential. Now, what was Nkrumah's Ghana like? Not to mention the many, many attempted assassinations, Nkrumah was faced with the task of leading a nation fresh from the shackles of colonization. 
Kwame Nkrumah's reign witnessed unprecedented progress and development. Infrastructure flourished, education thrived, and Ghana became a shining beacon of hope for other African nations. But amid all these triumphs, a storm was brewing, one that would test the resilience of a nation and the strength of its leader. Among the list of Nkrumah's achievements include the construction of the Abosso Glass Factory, Accra Technical University, Adomi Bridge, ADB Bank, Akosombo Textiles, Akosombo Dam, Atomic Reactor Station, the Bank of Ghana, and dozens more. Nkrumah's visionary ideals extended beyond the borders of Ghana. He championed the cause for Pan-Africanism, fervently advocating for the unity of all African nations. Recognizing the strength and solidarity, he forged alliances with like-minded leaders and played a pivotal role in the formation of the Organization of African Unity, which is the precursor to the current African Union. Nkrumah's unwavering belief in the collective strengths of Africa laid the ground up for a united front against the persistent remnants of capitalism and colonialism. Nkrumah was not without flaws, however. Overshadowing some of his successes was the galloping foreign debt to the IMF, the deployment of the much-needed Ghanaian military personnel, overt mass jailing without trial, and generally autocracy. At some point, he dismissed the Supreme Court, making himself the final arbiter of, of appeal. In 1964, Ghana became a one-party state under Nkrumah, and his father created anxiety among the elites and rage among the citizens. These wars were just the beginning of the end of his reign. This brings us to the final part, Nkrumah's overthrow. So how and why was the CIA involved in Nkrumah's overthrow? To understand the CIA's involvement, one must explore the 1960s global geopolitics. You see, Komen Kruma was first becoming the single most gargantuan threat to Western domination and exploitation of the African continent, particularly through his championing for the United States of Africa, devoid of foreign meddling. In his 1963 Addis Ababa speech titled, We Must Unite or Perish, Nkrumah insists on creating a unified Africa with a superstructure that would be impenetrable against neocolonialism. This is just but one of the reasons the West felt threatened by Nkrumah. Fast forward to 1966 at the height of the Cold War, the stage was set for a tragic comedy of epic proportions. The CIA, with the aid of Britain, Canada and local forces had other plans for Kwame Nkrumah. Fueled by Cold War ideologies and fears of communism, they viewed Nkrumah's progressive agenda as a threat to American interests. Following the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the defeat of Hitler's Nazi Germany in the Second World War, the Soviet Union and the USA emerged as the dominant powers. The USA supported capitalism, while the USSR championed communism. In the years leading to the, to the coup, the U.S. State Department withheld loans to Ghana and worked to lower world cocoa prices through stockpiling in order to deprive Nkrumah of foreign exchange. The USA feared that Nkrumah would sway the newly independent states towards the east, and just like dozens of African revolutionaries like Patrice Lumumba, Thomas Sankara, Sylvanas Olympio, Eduardo Mondlen, and even the recently toppled Muhammad Gaddafi, imperialism would end up claiming another one of Africa's true revolutionaries. A split between communist and capitalist ideologies has since resulted in deaths of tens of millions and countless coup d'etats across the globe. And then came the D-Day the 24th of February 1966. In Beijing airport, as the Chinese Premier Zhu Enlain was standing the cold winter waiting to welcome Kwame Nkrumah to China for the Vietnam War peace talks, a military coup was taking place in Ghana. As Nkrumah was airborne, little did he know that it would be the last time he would see his much-beloved Ghana. 
12,000 kilometers away in West Africa, the coup led by General Kotoka, Major Frifa, and other disgruntled military officers was underway. In barely 24 hours, they ousted Nkrumah from office and shattered the dreams of many Ghanaians who believed in his transformative leadership. As Premier Jew and Lame informed Kuruma of the happenings in his country, he took the news calmly and just mentioned one name, Kotoka who turned out to be the chief puppet of the CIA and its allies. In Ghana, the co-leaders informed the public of the regime change over the radio at dawn. Colonel Kotoka's statement over the radio was as follows. Fellow citizens of Ghana, I have come to inform you that the military in cooperation with the Ghana police has taken over the government today. The British press also reported that 40 CIA officers operated out of the U.S. Embassy distributing bribes among President Krumah's secret adversaries. According to the monthly review, at least 1,600 Ghanaians died in the coup and scores more were injured that day. Four days later, Nkrumah left Beijing for Guinea, where he was hosted by his friend President Sekou Toure, who made him the honorary co-president of Guinea. Later reports show that the CIA, under the directorship of Richard M. Helms, had organized intricate web of spies and informants and orchestrated a series of events that would ultimately lead to Nkrumah's downfall. Through a combination of internal dissent, economic destabilization, and propaganda campaigns, they dismantled Nkrumah's dream and Ghana's Osage for forever. In his book titled Search for Enemies, a former CIA operative John Rhys Tocqueville writes, and I quote, Inside the CIA headquarters, the Accra station was given full, if unofficial, credit for the eventual coup. None of this was adequately reflected in the agency's written records, end of quote. Equally, in his thesis, Eric Cuedo explores declassified documents from power powerful foreign relations of the United States between 1958 and 1960. These documents verify several allegations against the U.S. government. The CIA resorted to a wide variety of methods ranging from wiretrapping to influencing election campaigns, from the blasting of bridges to armed intervention. By the way, I have shared the links to the various sources down below. Ultimately, as the walls closed in around Kwame Nkrumah, he fought tirelessly to preserve his vision for a united Africa, but the forces against him were relentless, pushing Ghana into political turmoil and economic decline. Banished from his homeland, Nkrumah found himself in a state of despair. He was to spend half a decade in his new home in Guinea, engaged in writing projects and cultivating roses while waiting for the people of Ghana to call him back. As the years went by, Nkrumah's health deteriorated, mirroring the decline of his beloved Ghana. Eventually, he was stricken with cancer and he was flown to a clinic in Bucharest, Romania, where he died on April the 27th of 1972. The once thriving nation now grappled with instability and corruption, a far cry for the vibrant utopia he had inventioned. The laughter and joy that once filled the air had been replaced by somber silence. Through laughter and tears, we pay homage to a visionary leader whose spirit continues to resonate in the hearts of those who dare to dream. There's no question that Nkuruma made multiple mistakes and implemented unpopular policies. Still, his spirit lives on, echoing through the winds of change as his ideals continue to shape the destiny of the African continent. Nkrumah's vision of a united Africa is still alive and well. Please subscribe and like if you have not done yet. Until another time found, go ahead. Whose decisions are framed on the basis of resolutions that in our experience have sometimes been ignored by member states.